Okay, so this lecture is, in a way, a whole linear algebra course uh, created by highlighting five different ways that a matrix fa gets factored. By, by factored, I mean a, a, a factorization would be, the first example will be a matrix A, every matrix A factors into a matrix C and a matrix R, C times R, and I'll describe those. Um, and uh, so the and uh, later ones are, involve eigenvalues, they involve singular values. It's, it's linear algebra in a nutshell of these factorizations. So this is uh, coming from the latest and the final edition of my linear algebra book. I'm grateful to say uh, there's a sixth edition this year, 2023. Okay, for the start, let me start right out with some of the key ideas before you see the first factorization. So one key idea is whether a set of vectors is linearly independent or dependent. And that simply means, dependent simply means that some combination of those vectors gives the zero vector. And of course, I'm not allowing the zero combination, which takes zero of every vector, but some other combination, like two of the first vector plus three of the second vector minus 11 of the third vector gives the zero vector, that would mean those vectors were dependent. Okay, and combination, combinations is what you can do to vectors. You take combinations, mu multiply them by numbers, x1, x2, x3, multi they multiply the vectors a1, a2, a3, and then you add those, those together. So, uh, th th every time I teach linear algebra, this is in the first lecture. How do you multiply, or how to, and how do you think of a matrix A times a vector X? And I think of it not as a lot of little tiny computations dot products, but I think of it vector-wise. I think of A times X as a combination of the columns of the matrix. And uh, we'll come back to that, that's important. Okay, and now that third line is speaking about C times R. So those are matrices. Now we're multiplying a matrix by a matrix. Before it was a matrix times a vector. So I'll have to show you important ideas because there are several ways to multiply a matrix by a matrix and they're all important. It's a fantastic subject. And one example would be Every matrix will get factored. This will be factorization number one. Every matrix A will get factored into a, into a matrix C that just comes from the columns and a, times a matrix R that comes from the rows, which you will see soon. Okay. Oh, I even wrote it at the top, number one, A equals C R, but I'm going to leave the details the all important details for the coming slides. I thought here I would tell you uh, factorization number two, because it's probably the most used factorization in numerical computing. Probably billions of dollars a year are, are spent in taking a, a, this is usually a square matrix A, and we're trying to solve N, n equations in n unknowns where n could be 10,000. And the way to do it is a factorization. Uh, and it's known as LU. Everybody connects to, to that those words, LU. L is for lower and U is for upper. And those are used because the two matrices, L is a lower triangular matrix. Above the Diagonal of the matrix is all zero. All the non-zero parts of the matrix L are below. Whereas U is the opposite. It's zero below the diagonal and its non-zeros are all on the diagonal or above. So virtually all matrices factor into a lower triangular times an upper triangular. Sometimes you need a matrix P, a permutation, 
you'll see permutations show up here once in a while. That's just a reordering of the rows. Sometimes if the rows start with, if the first row starts with a zero, you're not happy with that and you have to, have to ch ch switch, switch rows. Okay, so, and why is, why is this L times U so great? Well, because you can solve AX equal B, let's say, solve a set of equations by first solving the problem with the matrix U and then, yeah, let me, it's, it's, so we're gonna solve it in two steps as the, as the slide says. The first step is to solve find the solution to L C equal B. So, so L is lower triangular, B is the right hand side we want, and C is the answer to that. You could say it's half the problem. It's the lower triangular half of the problem. So what that gives us an answer C. That's not the X that we're, that we're finally aiming for, but it's halfway. And then put that C on the right side, of the second equation, ux equals c. Now we're solving for x with the upper triangular part. You see the two triangular matrices? And triangular systems are fast to solve, and that's why it's just fantastic to split the matrix into two fast, fast cases. And then when you put them together, a times x is, a is lu, so we have lu times x, and the ux is c, so we have LC, and that was B. So we got AX equal B. Okay, that, every course is gonna teach that. I don't have to, I won't say more about that, but of course it's fundamental. So I'm gonna go back to this C times R, which is not so classical, but I think it's a great way to start linear algebra. Okay, okay, Here, here's an, an example, always the best. Okay, so you see a matrix A. You see it has three columns, one, two, one, one, three, four, three, seven, six, three columns. Uh, so, and it has three rows. So it happens to be a three by three square matrix. And it, it's small enough that we can find the C and the R. So listen up because this is what, this is the key point. So what's the matrix C? C is for columns. So you see that I took the first column and the second column of A and put them into C. One, two, one, and one, three, four. I did not take the third column in C, and why not? Because it's dependent. That th column three, seven, six is a combination of the others. So what do I mean by a combination? I mean that two of the first column would be two, four, two. And then if I add on one of the second column, one, three, four, I think that two, four, two and one, three, four add up to three, seven, six. So in a way, three, seven, six is already there in the first two. And, and, and that's reflected in the, in the R, in the, in the R matrix, the, the, the one that's more horizontal, that has rows, emphasizes the rows. So do you see, here we're seeing how matrices multiply. So, uh, so I, you see the matrix C with two columns and I'm multiplying by the matrix R that has two rows. And let's look at the third column of R. What do we see in the third column of R? We see the two and the one. That's exactly what we wanted to get the third column of A. So I'll just say again, columns one and two of A were independent. No, they go in different directions. So they go straight into the matrix C. Independent columns go in C. But R is aimed to catch up with the columns like the third column of A that are combinations. And again, you see why it's two and one? Because two of the first column plus one of the second column, that combination of independent columns gives the dependent column. Ha! Huh. So, and, and if I jump to the bottom line, uh, that matrix R, that, that row matrix, 
starts with the identity. Does everybody know about the identity matrix? It's, it's, the, it's the equivalent of one for matrices. If you multiply by the identity, you get, the, you get whatever back again. So the identity is that one, zero, zero, one part. And then the F part is the, is the part that reflects the dependent guy, the third column, two, one. So, I, so my point is going to be that every matrix, I can pick out the independent columns, put them in C, and then R will tell me what combinations of those independent columns gives all the columns. So, so here, here is the mathematical truth of this, of this thing. So we have, I'm going to use the letter little r for the, for, for the count of how many independent columns. So r was 2 before. Uh, the n minus r are the other columns, the dependent ones. So what my, the factorization is that every matrix A factors into C times r where C contains the independent columns and R has these sort of two or three pieces. So R has the identity. Do you see R? R is the IF with a P. So, so three, three matrices are, are, are involved with R. The identity matrix, because when C multiplies the identity matrix, it just gives those independent columns in C. Nothing, the identity doesn't do anything, the I. C times F, that's the combinations that give the dependent columns. And this uh, matrix uh, P, I'm tempted to say this damn matrix P, the permutation, just if the columns came in a crazy order or a different order, Instead of, it's, it's super nice when the independent ones all come first and then the dependent ones all come last. That's what we saw in the example. But, here, but there's an example at the bottom where the, can you pick out the independent columns in the matrix on the, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 4, 5 matrix? So the first column is independent, it's fine. But the second column is just two times the first. So that second column is dependent. And then we get an independent column, 3, 4. That's a new direction. And then we get 4, 5, which, which is dependent again. So this had two independent columns, the 1, 1 and the 3, 4. And you see them sitting in C. And then you have the R matrix that tells you how much of each independent column do you need to get every column of A. So, and, and there's, if you want the identity matrix to come first, that's what a permutation does. It switches the order of the, of the columns, and so it puts that identity matrix, the 1, 0, 0, 1 matrix first. Every matrix factors into C times R, and C is the independent columns, and R has this special form. It's famous as the row reduced echelon form, whatever. Okay, so onwards. So yeah, now here are the facts. C has, I'm using little r for the count of independent columns. It turns out the matrix R has that many rows. Then, and then A is equal to C times R. C times R, so there's Matrix multiplication is central here. Uh, so, and the C has, oh, and now I've introduced a new word, the column space. So we have a matrix. What's the column space? Let me go back to a matrix and talk about the column spaces. How about the column space of that, of that matrix A that we now understand pretty well? The column space is all combinations of the columns. So, I would say the column space of that matrix is all combinations of the first two columns because the third is already a combination. So I don't have to include it in the basis. The good word is the basis for the column space. 
If I'm wanting all the independent columns, if I'm wanting all the columns, I really just need the independent ones because the others are combinations. So the column space C is, the, is a plane here. It's the combination of just two vectors. And the row space R is also a plane. It's the combination of two rows, combinations of two rows. So we have a column space. Space is a big word. In, it means take all the combinations of, the, of, your, of your basis vectors. And so let me go forward to the great first theorem of linear algebra. It's, so this gave me pleasure. I have to admit that it's at that last line. The column space of a matrix, remember our, our matrix had two independent columns, and the row space, so that matrix has two independent rows. That's, mathematics is telling me that from A equals C times R. All rows of A are combinations of rows of R. This, you'll have to think about these ideas and, uh, and the first, uh, uh, and, and work some problems finding C and R and seeing this wonderful fact because if you had a matrix that was 50 rows and 100 columns, then it would not be clear for without a com big computer how many rows are independent and how many columns are independent. But the truth will be that those two numbers are the same. If it has 11 independent rows, it's got 11 independent columns. For, for me, that's just a wonderful fact. So that's, for, that's the first Great fact. And, and now here's the big picture of column space. So we are really moving along here. We are moving. So these boxes, these four boxes, are filled with vectors. So we call them vector spaces. So, and I'll sh describe what, what that, that word space is important. Okay. So what is the row space? That's all the, all the rows and all combinations of the rows. That makes the row space. You get a space by starting with some vectors, taking all their combinations. It fills out the plane. It fills out three, some three-dimensional space. It fills out some R-dimensional space. Let me just ask you, just, let's just take it. Suppose I have two vectors in three dimensions. Two independent vectors in three dimensions, like as in my example there. Uh, two independent vectors in three dimensions. So I'm in 3D, I'm in three dimensional space, and I take all combinations of those two independent vectors. And what do I get? I get a plane that goes through zero, zero, because one possible combination is zero, zero, and it's a nice flat plane in 3D. That's, that's, you can visualize that. That a base, it's, the dimension of the plane is two, because it took two vectors to give you everything you needed to know about the plane, take all combinations of those two vectors. So we had a two-dimensional plane inside three-dimensional space. What, what about the columns? Same, same idea. You start with the columns. You take all their combinations. So that's the column space. Again, the space means take all combinations. So it's a whole, it's, I've drawn it as a, as a square or a rectangle or a box. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's filled in by taking all combinations. It gives me a plane, it gives me a three-dimensional subspace. Well, if I have a bigger matrix, like a 10 by 10 matrix, then the rows, then I might have six independent columns. The column space of this, ten, of this matrix would be all combinations of those six independent columns. That they, they would each, all those, we're, we're sitting inside 10-dimensional space. Just, just visualize 10-dimensional space, or don't visualize it. I can't, but anyway, if you can, do it. 
So and in that vect in that space, the ten-dimensional space, is some thin, very thin part of it, which has only six independent vectors. So a six-dimensional column space inside the big ten-dimensional space. Okay. So the the first our first great theorem was that the number of independent rows equals the number of independent columns for every matrix. That, that's just wonderful. So that means that the size of the row space and the size of the column space are the same. And then the other two guys, the null spaces, are the solutions to AX equals zero. So AX equals zero says some combination of columns or of rows is giving zero. And so that this is accounting for the rest. So we had like six-dimensional row space inside ten-dimensional space. Then the null space, which I'll come back to, but the point is it will be four-dimensional so that six and four make ten. The, the, the whole ten-dimensional space is, is being split into the independent rows and the null space on one side and the independent columns and the null space of O, oh, you see this symbol A transpose. A transpose just means reverse the rows and uh, with the columns. If, if I have a matrix A with 10 rows and eight columns, then A transpose will be the other way around, eight rows and 10 columns. Oh, well, this is a whole linear algebra course, but we're, we're moving. I have to tell you a little bit how you would find which columns are independent and which are not. It's an algorithm. How would, we, how would a computer find the independent rows? We have to be able to answer that question because for big matrices, we need the computer. Okay, so uh, yeah, the, it, you remember, we're, it's interesting that the computer would look first for R, the row matrix, where, where I introduced, first of all, C, the columns, the independent columns. Well, it finds them both at the same time, it, this, this algorithm. It just progresses column by column across the matrix. Column by column, we go across the matrix, and we ask, is this new column, say column k plus 1, is it a combination of those previous k columns or is it independent? That's the key question. If it's a combination of the other ones, then it'll go in with the f part. If it's independent of the first ones, it'll be a new independent one and it'll go, it'll, the i, the identity matrix, will grow by 1. So I, I, I'm not going to push you to follow the steps of, the, of this elimination. Well, actually, they were, elimination was invented in China three or 4,000 years ago. So it's, it's a fundamental idea. It's just subtract a multiple of one row from another row to get a zero in a place where you want a zero. You, you, we can understand what's going on when we have, when our matrix has enough well-placed zeros. So, so elimination is just subtracting rows from other rows to produce zeros in the right position so we can see what's going on. Oh, here, we are, here we're actually going to use elimination and see and the idea of null space and the, idea of equations. So this is, this we can do, this we can do. So over at the top left, you see uh, three equations, and you see four unknowns, x1, x2, x3, x4. So we have a three by four matrix. And it's a full matrix, it hasn't got any zeros. And the idea of elimination is to get some zeros into that matrix. In fact, we can see where those arrows are showing what, where we want to go. So, so we're starting with the matrix A, 
three by four matrix with these numbers, one, three, four, two, seven, nine, 11, 37, 48. Are, are those columns independent or not? Elimination will tell us. Okay. And we want to know at which rows are independent. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to look at that, those numbers at the top for a little while. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll go halfway down just to sh share the, the, the nice math notation. So, so I wrote the equations at the top, but really I wasted a lot of time writing in all those plus signs and equal signs and, and so on. Uh, really, it's the numbers that count. So you, saw, you see the numbers 1, 2, 11, 17 in the first row. So they go in the first row of the matrix. I just skip all the plus signs and x1, x2s. I know, know they're there. It's the numbers that matter. And then we have our, we, we get by elimination to this much simpler form, R, with the matrix R, uh, now, let's see, maybe we could do some of these in our head. I think that if I add equation 1 to equation 2, I get equation 3. Do you, do you agree with me? If I add, uh, take up, I'm at the top, top left of the, of, the, of the slide. If I add x1 to 3x1, I get 4x1. And if I add 11x3s to 37x3s, I get 48x3s. Of course, I cooked it up this way. So if I, instead of adding, if I, sub, if I subtract the first equation from the third, and I subtract the second equation from the third, then I have nothing left. That equation becomes 0 equals 0. That tells me that really this matrix, this big matrix A, has only two independent rows. That 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 I'm they're sitting there in R. Do you see that? You see R, the 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 long the last matrix, the one zero three five. That comes from the first equation after elimination, and the zero one four six. Those are the coefficients of x one, x two, x three, x four in the second equation. And I didn't even bother to write the zero equals zero equation because I don't. Need, don't need it or want it in R. R gets rid of all the zero equals zero stuff. So, where are we? We started with a matrix A. Well, we started with four equations, and the, the numbers in those equations went into A. And I did elimination. I did, I sub subtracted three times row one from row two and that knocked out the 3x1 and so forth. So I ended up with the equations on the right, which went into R, the 1035 and the 0146. You see, as predicted, we start with the identity matrix in R, the 1001, and then we have the other stuff, the dependent, coming from the dependent stuff. And we started with the first two columns in, in C, 1, 3, 4, 2, 7, 9, those are our original first two columns. And we didn't have the third column or the fourth column because those are combinations of the first two. So this is a matrix of rank two. It has two independent columns, the first two, and it's got two independent rows, which are, I could choose the first two rows of A, or better, the first two rows of R. What the, the whole point of this was to be able to solve Rx equals zero. And the, when, I, when I've got, or Ax equals zero is the same as Rx equals zero now. And R is this simple matrix. So do you see that that vector minus three, it, down where it's talking about the null space, null means zero. So these two vectors there, they solve Rx equals zero, and therefore they solve Ax equals zero. That, that's what you're looking for in solutions of equations. If you took that minus three, minus four, one, zero vector, those, the, those are x1 and x2 and x3 and x4, they easily solve our 
our simplified equations at the top. So altogether, we have done what professors assign students to do for centuries of linear algebra. We have solved the equations by elimination. We had some messy equations. We took combinations of those to give some nice equations. Then we solved those nice equations. And we could express the result as these two vectors at the bottom, or but we could express the whole elimination as C times R, the two independent columns of A times the two rows of R. Oh, th this was like, uh, uh, this is my final slide on this first factorization. And then I, I'm, I'm not going to give such detail on the later factorizations because the textbook and, the prof and your professor know those so well. Uh, I, I just want to say here that uh, matrices, uh, really using matrices in, in matrix algebra is, is wonderful. And one of the things you can do is to break them into smaller matrices. So you see that W, H, J, K? Well, that's, that's our big matrix with four sub-matrices in it. And W is the part of the matrix that's coming from independent columns. So that arrow in the top line says that W moves to the identity. That's, that was the theme of all those crazy computations we did, was to make that top left corner into the identity. And then it makes the rest of the matrix into what you see. That, but just to say that if you think of elimination by blocks instead of just single numbers, then you see the big picture, the big picture. But the, 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 the real picture was done on that slide, slide at the top. That's where we did the elimination. And and then we got the piece, the nice pieces that we're, we're seeing here. <clears throat> okay, so that was all factorization one a equals c r because you need some help with that. Uh, that that's that's brought up so many of the key ideas and tools of linear algebra go into a equals c r and it's just. Wonderful. Okay, so now, oh, I'm seeing the word orthogonal. So this next factorization is takes a matrix A, and it t the columns of A are probably not perpendicular to each other. All, all the examples we had, the columns of A, if I looked at the angle between them, it wasn't 90 degrees. They, there's a simple test for perpendicular that's called the dot product. And it, matrices usually, vectors don't, don't pass that test. They're not perpendicular. But it's wonderful when they do. Perpendicular vectors are super easy to compute with. Orthogonal is just another word for perpendicular. So, and it's a shorter word and a more used word. Okay. So what's the idea of this factorization? Again, we take any matrix A, and we're going to get it into two factors. But they're not going to be L and U anymore. They're not going to be C and R. They're going to be Q times R. And Q is this new idea, this new idea of perpendicular vectors. I just want to say that perpendicular vectors are so easy to compute with. It's, it's, if, if independent vectors are good, perpendicular vectors are super independent because they're going in 90 degree directions. And look to see the nice equation that you get if you have these perpendicular vectors. So I'll use that letter Q, little, little Q. So do you see where I'm multiplying a matrix Q transpose times Q 
in the middle, that, that matrix multiplication. So Q, the columns of Q are our orthogonal vectors, and I adjust their length to be one. That's no problem. So they're perpendicular and their lengths are one. And Q transpose, well, so transpose is an operation that we use a lot. It just changes the rows, the columns into rows. So the columns were Q1 to Qn in, in, in the second factor. And then the first factor, we changed Q1 to Q1 transpose, which is a row. So, so we have now n columns, perpendicular vectors in Q, and we have n rows that are perpendicular vectors in Q transpose. That T is for short for transpose. And the whole point is that when I multiply those two matrices, Q transpose times Q, that's when the perpendicular stuff pays off because Q1 transpose times Q2 is zero. Perpendicular vectors, they're, when you multiply them, or a row times a column, if they're perpendicular, you get zero. So we actually get the identity matrix from Q transpose times Q. So that means Q is a, well, Q is one, is for me, uh, well, I'll say the queens of linear algebra. I'm not making them the kings, but the queens of, of linear algebra are these matrices whose columns are length one and perpendicular to each other. Uh, but this is an important idea, that if I start with a bunch of independent vectors, they're going in different directions, no combination is zero, then I can turn, bend, turn those vectors by a matrix R so that they are not just going in different directions, they're going in 90 degree perpendicular directions. It's, it's just terrific to have vectors that are perpendicular. So that's actually factorization three is, is doing it to the columns of A, and then factorizations four and five are doing it to, uh, you'll see, factorizations four and five are the great achievements of linear algebra. So, I promised you five factorizations, and we've got three, two to go, and they're actually together here. They're, they, they'll take time in, in the course, and, and uh, uh, so one is about eigenvalues. Every professor wants to explain eigenvalues. Those are nice eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And the other one is about what are called singular values and singular vectors. Not so famous except for the fact that they are the best of all. So I'll try to compare them so you'll see how they're related. Because uh, eigenvalues are sort of simpler to see, but singular values are important too. Okay, so, so let's suppose we have, uh, it's nice if the matrix is symmetric, S. So S for a symmetric matrix, that means that if I flip it across the diagonal, it's still the same. So the number that's in the bottom left is also in the top right. Now, here's the key idea, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that matrix S. So the big equation is S times X equals number lambda times X. S, X equal lambda X. What does that mean? That means that X, a vec X is a vector, S is a known matrix, known symmetric matrix. And I'm looking for vectors X which don't change direction when you multiply them by S. They don't change direction. Previously, we might have been looking for vectors that go to zero, SX equals zero. Not now. We have the key equation you'll see in that top line is S times X equals a number lambda times x. So it's still in the direction of x. Its length just got changed by that factor lambda. 
So, and that lambda is called the eigenvalue. X is the eigenvector. Eigen is a sort of German prefix that is everybody uses here. Yeah. So, so S X equal lambda X. You will study that type of question. It's how do you find the X's and the lambdas? In a way, the problem is nonlinear because lambda is multiplying X. So it's it's not like S X equal B, a right hand side. S X equal lambda X takes new ideas and you'll see them. Okay. And the beautiful thing is that when S is a symmetric matrix, then these eigenvectors, these X's, it turns out that they, they're perpendicular to each other. And so if I stay on the left side of the screen, which is about S, you'll see that S, X, uh, if I, if I use matrix notation, S times, I can list all the eigenvectors. There are N of them, luckily. So same size as S. If I multiply S times those eigenvectors, I get those eigenvectors back again times that diagonal matrix of lambdas, which are just numbers. So S X equals X lambda. That's the factorization four. Well, I can put the X on the far right and write, write it differently as S equals X lambda X inverse. A matrix, a symmetric matrix X is its eigenvector matrix X times its diagonal eigenvalue matrix lambda times the inverse of X. That, so it's a factorization that's got three matrices in it now. Okay. That, you're going to learn about those guys. That, that's, uh, this, this is the second half of the course. The first half of the course was elimination, spaces of vectors, AX equals zero, linear equations. Now we are deeper with eigenvectors and with singular vectors and singular values. Now what do those mean? The point is that Every matrix doesn't have to be square, doesn't have to be symmetric. Every matrix A has a full set of singular values and what are, and vectors. Singular vectors are really more important than the value, than the numbers. The values are those numbers, sigma or lambda, that scale things. It's the vectors that are great. We'll always take the vectors to be length one and then the scaling goes into the sigma or lambda. Okay, so what are, what's the deal with singular values? I'm, I'm now telling you about number five, factorization five, the, the, the end of uh, a linear algebra course, tip frequently, or in the past courses didn't get as far as singular values, but you gotta push to get there. Because it's so important, it's become more important. Oh, it's hard to say this. More important than eigenvalues? Well, it's closely, so closely related that you, but you just have to, singular vectors apply even when the matrix is rectangular and uh, it, they apply to every matrix. So they are exceptional. And what is the main point of singular vectors? Listen up, because this is it. Every matrix A has, you can find, a bunch of perpendicular vectors, inputs, V1, V2, up to VR, the rank, the number of independent vectors. So, so orthogonal, orthogonal vectors going in, Vs, multiply by A, and orthogonal vectors come out. Not, for eigenvectors, they come out in the same direction. For other matrices, that's too much. That, you can't expect them in the same direction. But the amazing, miraculous thing is that you can, there are orthogonal vectors going in. If you pick the right orthogonal perpendicular vectors going in, then the, and multiply by A, then perpendicular vectors come out. So 
So, so sing these are singular vectors that a matrix takes a orthog a one orthogonal bunch of, you could say, in, in uh, orthogonal one set of orthogonal vectors in the row space multiplies, produces orthogonal vectors u. Yeah. So, so that also is a matrix factorization. But if I, and, and the famous one is the one halfway down the page on the far right, A equals the U matrix times this diagonal sigma matrix times the V transpose, the outputs. No, no, sorry, the Vs are the inputs because being on the right, they're going to hit, they're going to hit the, a new vector the first. So if I multiply by X, I, I hit them with V or V transpose, that rotates the space. Then comes, then I hit them with sigma, this diagonal matrix that just stretches the thing. And then I rotate again. Isn't that amazing? Every, every matrix is a product of a rotation, a, a diagonal stretching matrix, and another rotation. Well, you know what it means to rotate a plane. Just, you know, rotate a plane through an angle. If you're an airline pilot, you know what about, you know about rotations in 3D. What are those? Yaw is one of them. Uh, there are three rotations that an airplane can do uh, in the same plane, either horizontal plane or vertical plane. One angle, if we have just a, uh, in, in a plane, the rotation just takes one angle. In, in three-dimensional space, it takes three angles. In four-dimensional space, well, that's for the linear algebra course. So that, so what are, what are we saying? What does this, this singular value stuff tell me? It says again that for every matrix, I can find perpendicular vectors for inputs, and when I multiply the, the matrix, the outputs are perpendicular too. That's what it says. That's what it says. Perpendicular inputs that give perpendicular outputs. They're very special. Normally that won't happen. But there is a set of, of perpendicular inputs where the outputs are perpendicular. And I'm going to show you that, or try to, in, in 2D, in 2D. So I'm looking, I'm, I'm thinking I have a, a two by two matrix. And my vectors V and W are the usual one zero and zero one. So if I multiply them by this matrix, so they're perpendicular, all right? V is perpendicular to W, no problem. If I multiply by my matrix, I get A times V and A times W. Well, the odds are a million to one that they're not perpendicular. I didn't. I can't expect so much luck that the maybe maybe if the matrix was a diagonal matrix or some simple guy, then A V and A W would be perpendicular. But generally, they won't be. So V and W are not the pair that I'm the input pair that I'm looking for. Okay, let me make one more try and fail again. I'm going to try. Uh, to put in W and minus V. So I'm looking at the middle picture now. I'm looking at the middle picture. I'm, I'm multiplying W by A, so that still gives me the AW, and I'm multiplying minus V by A, so it comes out like 180 degrees around from the original AV in the first picture, is A minus V in the second picture. If you think, you need to think about it. This is a little bit of a proof. So what's the point? Well, this new pair, W and minus V, didn't, didn't work either. The angle was not 90 degrees after I multiplied by A, and that's what I'm shooting for. OK, but here's the little idea, small idea. That the angle in the first case was smaller than 90 degrees when, when I multiplied by A. The AV and the AW 
I, some small angle theta between them. But now if I multiply w and minus v by a, I get a big angle, bigger than 90 degrees. And mathematics steps into the, into the problem here, in the, looking for an idea. And mathematics says that somewhere between the vw that I started with and the minus v, and the w minus v, the second pair, somewhere there's a little v and a little w that get that make it right, because it was a v was too close to a w in the first picture, they were too far apart in the second picture. But as I, if I go smoothly around, I'll, go, I'll hit a point where they're exactly right, and that's what the third picture is telling me. So there's a proof that, that every two by two matrix, this is a two dimensional proof, that every two by two matrix has a pair, little v, little w, which are perpendicular, and then also a times v and a times w are perpendicular. So that's factorization five, and that's my, that's, if you cover that in, in linear algebra course, you're doing well. But I have, despite the fact that that slide is numbered 12 out of 12, there is another slide that doesn't have a number. Okay, if you're up for this, this is about deep learning. So if you, if you want a, a job, eventually, probably most people, would like to have a job, then a lot of jobs we know are coming from deep learning. So I, I, was, I would tell you like a little bit of, this is the last chapter in the linear algebra book, probably not part of the linear algebra course officially, but why not learn about deep learning, uh, artificial AI? What's, what, is, what is deep learning? Well, deep learning starts with some training data, some inputs with known outputs. So I'll call the inputs U1, U2, U3. I maybe have, maybe have a thousand in, known inputs and a thousand known outputs. I've got a lot of information from the training data. And then I want to be able to predict for a new input, U, not one of these known ones, not part of the training data, but a new guy, what is the output? So I, I'm going to assume that the, the relationship, which I'm never going to know, the relationship is something reasonable. That, that if, I, if I have a, if my new input is near to one of the U's, the, near, the, the output will be near to one of the W's but it'll be affected by all the other U's and W's. So it's, it's called interpolation or something. You're, I'm looking for a function that fits the data, and then I can use that function for new data, test data, where I don't know the output. Okay, that's, that's the thing. And now I want to tell you the key idea of deep learning. The, the question is, what kind of a function are we going to choose? We're, we're going to, it'll have some freedom so that we can make it fit the known training data. We can create, there are a lot of, there are a zillion ways I could create a function that was correct on the known data that gave me the right answers W from the inputs U. What I want is, to be good on data that I haven't seen. And that was the important problem, important scientific problem that has been largely solved and understood much better, but there's more to understand still, by uh, deep learning. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna go quickly here. The question is what kind of, what, what kind of function should we have? What kind of function should should I try? One big matrix. Well, matrices are linear, and and I don't know any reason why this this unknown function should be linear. 
So matrices are going to come in there, but also some nonlinear stuff has to come in. And it turns out, do you remember the chain rule from calculus? It's the, it's the, it's a cool rule out of calculus that if what a chain of functions you you take a first you take an input give it to, input in a function f1 you take that output put it into f2 take that output put it into f3 there's a chain of chain of simple functions is a is a good idea it you, you quickly can build up quite a quite a array of, of interesting functions out of very simple ones and now comes the very last slide uh, to tell you the particular functions that deep learning uses. The particular functions that deep learning. That, so people tried linear. They they multi, the, the function the function a k times the input plus some vector b k, like a straight line is a x plus b. So so. The first attempts were had linear stuff. Well, how can I teach linear algebra and, and and have to confess here that linear is a limitation, a big limitation, and it was too much. And and a good linear interpolation doesn't. There isn't one. You've got to make something nonlinear. And and here's the crazy thing: the the fact that. Has surprised everybody that that this a particular nonlinear function that everybody calls ReLU, R E L U. That's a not, that's a particular function that's zero for when the input is negative, and it gives back the input y when y is positive. So it's so the graph of the function is two straight lines, horizontal line below zero. 45 degree line above zero. That's ReLU. So that's a nonlinear function just of a, of a number. The input is a number. Tell me, so what is ReLU of minus seven? If I input minus seven, the ReLU of minus seven is zero. What is ReLU of plus seven? Seven. So I get zero or seven when I input minus seven or seven. Okay, that's the, that's the magic function. Anyway, the idea is to use that nonlinear function in every one of these simple f's, and then you put all these f's in a chain, and then you find these matrices A and B that are the, that are the substantial part of the function, and it's a giant calculation, which we are not going to do here, but it's a success. This, this idea has created functions. It may not be the only way to do it. I would like to say, I would like to hope and think that there could be, from this one, we could learn, the, learn what's important and find other ways of creating a functions. But this combination of a chain of very simple functions. Each of those simple functions involves linear a matrix A and a vector B. And then this ReLU thing, this nonlinear thing, that knocks out the negative part, and then go on to the next function, on to the next function, and choose the good A and B to fit your data. And then uh, you've got a way to predict the output for new input. And uh, that's what so many problems are about. If, if you know some training inputs and outputs, how do you predict the output from a new and different input? Well, that's what deep learning does. And I hope this last couple of slides, which, are, which represent the final chapter of the sixth edition of Introduction to Linear Algebra. Um, and I could, uh, yeah, uh, a, a lot of people email me to, about the books or about Linear Algebra, and uh, that makes my life interesting too. Thank you. <laughs>